Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. We lost a very valuable client. Thanks God. The second story. My leaving started a chain reaction. Sweet justice. The third story. The employee did not even suspect that the owner was actually a fraud. The first story is 99% of the time, I don't like hearing that we've lost a customer, but this guy is the exception. We've all come across our fair share of customers who we simply cannot satisfy, no matter how well or badly things go. Yet they continue to come back time and after time after time, almost as if they relish in making the employees miserable. They usually never do anything bad enough to be banned from a place, but you just hope for that one day that they give you that opening. Today was that day, my friends. I've worked at a small, authentic Mexican restaurant in my hometown for three years, and this pain in the A has been there since day one. To paint a picture, imagine that Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men had a dweebish twin brother. This man sounds like he constantly has something stuck in his throat, and dresses like he ransacked the clearance section of a local thrift shop. I mention the last part because to my surprise, this man is actually a fairly wealthy accountant in the area. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Anton is very well liked, due to the fact that whenever he would try to reach out to fellow customers he recognized, they would politely brush him off and do their best to ignore him for the rest of their meal. Long story short, this man is an a-hole who made it his mission to be as cheap and frustrating as possible with those he deems as below him, such as myself. This first time I ever served Anton, he ordered an a la carte chimichanga. He only wanted ground beef inside, not the beans. I tell him that I'd be happy to have that fixed up for him. When I set down the chimmy in front of him, he looked at me and asked where were the beans, to which I looked at him and said, you said no beans inside the chimichanga. He then went on to explain that he thought he could get them on the side, instead of inside. I told him that we weren't allowed to do so as the a la carte menus doesn't come with sides, hence it being served a la carte. He went on again to say that a coworker of mine had been doing it for years. I told him that I would double check with my boss while he was eating to make sure I probably understood how our menu worked. I explained to my boss what was going on, prompting her to look at the camera and see who I was talking about. She swore and told me, he knows that we don't allow people to do that. Tell him that the manager says you aren't allowed to do that and leave it at that. I went back, relayed my manager's message to Anton, to his major disapproval, and went about my duties. After he paid, I found that he had left the exact amount for me with no tip. It was annoying but I had prepared myself for it. What I was not prepared for was dealing with this individual for the next three years, arguing over the exact same thing every single time, and him getting upset when I told him that wasn't our policy every single time. It was a song and dance I was accustomed to at this point, until one week ago. I didn't notice Anton walk into the restaurant last Tuesday afternoon. I was doing my side work before leaving for the evening, and a fellow server who had not taken him as a table before took his order. Misunderstanding how he was trying to order his usual meal, my coworker put in an a la carte chimichanga with no beans inside, as well as an a la carte plate of beans for a side dish. Anton thought he had finally beat the system, until he received his bill. Usually I informed fellow servers that were seated with him about what he would try to do and how to respond. This server is newer, so she didn't necessarily understand how to go about it. Instead of trying to have the beans removed, Anton chose to not pay for most of his tab. This meant my coworker was left to foot the rest of the bill. Nothing major, mind you, but I'm sure we can all agree you'd rather someone not be made to pay for someone else's food. I told my coworker that the next time he came in, I would handle the situation for her. So who should I find strutting into the place today but our friend who loves beanless chimichangas, Anton. I planned on taking his order as usual. Then with my manager's approval, I would address our friend for shorting our server on the bill last time. We had saved the ticket and the amount he put towards it. However, when it came time to order and I informed him that he could not get beans on the side unless he paid for them, Anton tried to say that the last time he was here someone said that he'd always been able to. I looked at him, sighed, and began to calmly explain how I knew that the last time he was here he had received beans on the side but were charged for them. Then I went into explaining how we knew he had not paid for his entire tab the last time he was here. Basically the beans and the tax. I asked that if he would be willing to pay for the amount he owed from the last meal, as well as his order tonight. He looked at me like I had just said I effed his sister. So much confusion and animosity in one glare. I promise you friends, I did not raise my voice, nor did I threaten him with banning him from the restaurant. I asked for him to pay what he owed, 
He chugged his half-price beer, pulled out two wadded-up dollar bills and flung them into the complimentary chips basket. Thankfully, not the salsa. He asked me if I was really going to hound him over his previous tab and lose a valuable customer like him after all these years. I replied that I was not trying to lose his business, but again asked that he paid what he owed, which the $2 didn't cover. He said that he didn't care and the $2 was all he'd give us, that he'd take his business elsewhere, and that he hopes that I learn how to contribute to society like a normal effing person someday. I watched Anton walk out the door, grab the $2 and handed them to my coworker. She thanked me and I said, I've been waiting for this moment for years. Sorry you had to be the catalyst. Typing all this out, I realized how stupid and petty this all really is. In addition, I do not relish in having lost business for our small business. But when you choose to try and manipulate a place that has put up with your penny pinching and BS for at least three years, and then not pay what you owe, I cannot help but feel a sense of relief not having to have the same confrontation over and over again. At least for a while. Who knows? The second story is... Walking out of my exploitative housekeeping job was one of the best natural highs I've ever had. Now 50% of the staff has quit or been fired. Since August 2019, I worked at a small three-star hotel, but corporate always acted like it was a Parisian resort. Their constantly shifting and vaguely communicated expectations drove four general managers out, which resulted in multiple months-long spans with a corporate substitute GM. This person was a former GM at my property, who talked her way into a corporate position that didn't previously exist. Three weeks ago, we got a new GM and AGM. Almost immediately, they expected the housekeepers to do 50% more work on Sunday. We've been fully booked with weddings every weekend for the past five months, and it's rare to have a shift under eight hours on a Sunday, and they can extend indefinitely longer. There are only five housekeepers for all 80 rooms, so it wasn't feasible for us to clean every room in one day unless there are 80 arrivals in 80 dirty rooms. That's only happened one time in my tenure at the hotel. Normally we have 30 to 50 surplus vacant rooms at the end of the day on Sunday, more than enough to accommodate walk-ins. There is no tactical business advantage to flipping the entire hotel in one day, other than that it looks good on paper. If we put aside 20 rooms on Sunday to be cleaned Monday through Wednesday, then the shift length is consistent most days of the week. Nobody wants to work 11 hours on Sunday and 3 hours every other day of the week. This past Sunday, after an abnormally busy weekend, these new expectations were dropped on us as our head housekeeper was assigning rooms for the day. The AGM wanted us to have every room clean, which would have averaged out to 15 per person. We've assigned 10 per person every Sunday for two years without issue. Our head housekeeper talked her down to assigning 13 rooms per person, leaving nine to be cleaned the next day. Setting a dirty room aside is known as rolling the room. An hour later, she told our head housekeeper to assign the nine rolled rooms and have 15 per person as originally planned. The head housekeeper called us into the stock room to tell us what was going on. 13 rooms was bad enough after two of the busiest days I've had at that place, and 15 felt undoable at that point. This was the consensus of all the housekeepers, so we all went down to the AGM's office to try to appeal to her reasonable side. This is the push of the first domino. The housekeepers were voicing all the concerns listed above, and the AGM acted completely dismissive and annoyed, interrupting everybody who tried to talk. I finally had to cut her off mid-sentence and tell her to not interrupt my coworker while he told his story about asking three AGMs and a maintenance man for new vacuums over the course of a year, to no avail. The AGM begrudgingly let us roll the original nine rooms before chastising all of us for not respecting her. For the next hour, I sat in the dirty room I'd been working on, fuming with anger. I tried to straighten sheets and wipe down the desk, but it felt as if an invisible hand was grabbing my arms and keeping me from working for a company full of people, who were completely unrespectable. I didn't know what to do. I remembered seeing a single die on my housekeeping cart and I grabbed it. If it rolls even, I stay. If it rolls odd, I leave, I said. I rolled a one. I promptly put my cart away and said goodbye to all my coworkers. I begged them not to let themselves be exploited. Then I walked down to the front desk where the AGM was with my clipboard of 12 dirty rooms. The exchange proceeded as follows. Me. Hey, do you know how to roll rooms in the system? AGM. Yeah, I do. Me. Good. Can you roll these 12? I'm leaving. AGM. Okay. Me. Hey, at least I got my one arrival done. Before I walked out, I popped my head back into the front desk and said cheerfully, this is all your fault. I walked out for the last time and was overcome with euphoria. I don't have that black cloud hanging over my head anymore. I won't have to dream about the horrible mundanity of going into identical room after identical room, and the disgusting animalism of people who think being the friend of a bride or groom entitles them to turn their room into a landfill. Gone are the days of scrubbing black, crusty Guinness SH from a toilet bowl. 
Gone are the days of locking myself in the room I'm working so management can't find me and disrupt my workflow. I feel freer than I've felt in a long time. My departure started a chain reaction. The next day, two of our front desk people quit. Another talks of quitting. A housekeeper puts her notice in, and her best friend, who's also a housekeeper, will likely follow. Another two housekeepers were fired, including the head housekeeper. Both were fired for disrespect. Today, a front desk person was also fired for disrespect, only to receive a phone call from our crying GM, who apparently saw the error in her ways. She offered them their old job back, and they demanded a 3.50 an hour raise. By the looks of it, this hotel is going to fail. The remaining staff already hate the GM and AGM, and with the sudden staff shortage, they all have more incentive to quit. This is beautiful. This is justice. And the last story is... Crypto Scam. Obligatory this didn't happen to me. Didn't even happen at my hotel, but our sister hotel next door. About a year ago, our sister hotel's night auditor received a phone call from someone claiming to be the owner. In order to prove his legitimacy, the caller tells the night auditor that he's the one wearing a blue shirt. Our owner does have cameras around the hotels that he can view from his security station at home, so him knowing this makes some sense. The caller proceeds to tell this night auditor that he ordered a $1,000 package, but shipping was not paid for. In order to receive the package in the morning, shipping needs to be paid. The caller ordered the night auditor to get all the cash out of the cash drawer, and the cash out from the safe in order to pay for the shipping cost. The night auditor, for some reason or another, has access to the safe and takes the money out of both locations. The caller informs the night auditor that to pay this shipping cost, he'll need to convert the cash to the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. A location in order to do this is at least a 20 minute drive. This may be where you expect red flags to go off, right? Well, no. The night auditor tells security to watch the desk. He's going on a drive. He gets into his personal car and leaves the property with the cash on hand to convert it to crypto. During the run, the caller insists a consistent phone call with the night auditor in order to ensure no hiccups occur. This is when security at least gets a bit curious. He calls my hotel and speaks to our night auditor and gives him the rundown. Our night auditor instantly recognizes it's a scam and informs security. After an hour, an hour, the night auditor returns. The night auditor successfully converted the funds entirely to crypto and gave the crypto wallet to the caller. Security tells the night auditor that he was informed from us that this is certainly a scam. This prompted a phone call between the two properties where my night auditor shared all the crazy scam phone calls he gets and hangs up on. Let me break this down a little further. This night auditor was seasoned and worked at the hotel for years. The hotel had no change, no coins, no bills for the rest of the weekend until Monday. The caller must have had visual sight of the night auditor in order to confirm his shirt color, which means he was right there in the area. Glass windows, yay. The night auditor was promptly fired. Night auditors have lost access to the safe. The hotel did not recover its funds from the scam. Shipping costs are paid for by the invoice, which repeated business, i.e. hotels will pay. They'll never ask for cash or payment up front. Owners will not call you. Speak to your GM if one claims they're the owner. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and have a good day.